But I want to say to my little brother, I used to call him Musara Pavana. In our scheme of things, we believe that all the people are greatest. And so he always used to insist that he will inherit my wife. And I told him that the earlier he gets um, accustomed to my wife, the better. So that when I depart, their relationship will not <laughs> I want to say to his wife and children, and to all of you who are gathered here, that was Zimbabwe's first. As I'm telling you personal stories, we had uh, vicious differences in a number of uh, academic areas, a number of political issues. But Alex was very direct. Even during the time of the MDC, uh, the three presidents he spoke about, he encouraged them to come together. That was the type of person that he was. So he was not only critical of the other side, but he was also inherently critical of what was happening within his own political space. And I think that's, I don't know why he's laughing. <laughs> I think I should stop now. <laughs> but I really want to say, uh, with all honesty, that we have lost, as Zimbabwe, but the whole world has lost. If you go and read eulogies that have been posted from all over around you, you feel a sense of pride. We must be able to disagree, but disagree honorably. Alex would never leave you with the feeling that he was paneling you down in an argument. He would always make you feel more important than himself. But sure, thank you very much. <laughs> so I think uh, you know we 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 take for granted what we mean by Alex was prolific. So let me give you an example. The BSR was read by over 250,000 people every week. I'm an academic. I think last week I was celebrating that a publication I wrote four or five years ago has reached 6,000 reads. <laughs> <laughs> so we are not talking of, uh, we're not just celebrating somebody for the sake of it. This was an intellectual giant. His work spoke for itself. And the consistency, capacity to produce every week something brand new is amazing. But I don't want also to take my three and a half minutes now. May I call upon Koma, um, Koma Dr. Naito Chanakira to come and just uh, say <laughs> Thank you very much uh, to our MC, Doc Murisa. Uh, let me recognize the guest of honor, who happens to be my Nguya, Gogo Beatrice Mutetwa, the president of uh, Triple C, and uh, all the leaders, all government officials here present, Muria Kwama Gaisa, my Magaisa, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Peace and grace to you all. My heartfelt condolences to all of you. Particularly also his numerous followers. 250,000 readers, as you say, uh, Dr. Lisa, is no mean feat. Where was I when I heard the news? No fancy that I was right here at this church. This is where I fellowship. And Pastor Tom had just preached a, a storm, preached up a storm. Um, it was um, that sort of Sunday where you go, you hear a message and you leave and you're kind of bewildered. And I left here. And I went down Churchill, Churchill Road, and uh, at the 
corner of 2nd Street extension, there was a huge truck pass there, park there that broken down. And my wife, in her wisdom, urged me to reverse the car and go the other way, which I did. I did that and tried to just turn ahead of the truck. And lo and behold, we had a car crash. Someone smashed into us. And we missed death by a whisker. Yeah. And I mean, I was just, I was in total shock. I'm still, I'm still quite shaken. I held my phone, deciding who to call. And then uh, Zizi, um, Zreva, Zreva, he might actually be in here. Zizi? No, he's not. And he sent me a message right there and then that Alex had passed away. You can well imagine what impact that had on me. I had just missed death by a whisper. And so I was quite devastated upon hearing the news and uh, deeply saddened that that could have been me on the same day, almost at the same time. But here was what crossed my mind. I couldn't help but think that my affairs were not in order. I had to come to that conclusion. I was not ready. And Bishop Magaya has just delivered a message <coughs> encouraging us to be ready. We just don't know when anything can happen. Sure. My pastor had just urged us, and I'm an elder in this, this very ministry, but I concluded there and there that I wasn't ready. And so it was so heartbreaking hearing that a good man who was a yardstick of humbleness had just passed on. What a loss to the country. I can only assume that the organizers of this memorial lecture would have been tracking the threads of our conversations on social media platforms, either on Twitter or on the private WhatsApp message, message uh, groups that I am in. I was just counting today that I was actually in nine groups where Alex participated in. He was a thought leader. And I can only imagine that it is the tussling that I had with Alex just as an economist and as a businessman that led them to think that I was actually a close friend. The reality is I actually never met the guy. And yet, he was like a brother. And I viewed him as such. I remember thinking in those groups and reading the BSR as I did so religiously, thinking, where does this chap get the time to write so prolifically? He never seemed to tire in terms of arguing a point. He was so deep, so well-meaning, so passionate, if not patriotic. He loved this country so deeply. My view was he was wise beyond his age. He was very discerning. I actually first came across him indirectly when as a young global leader of the World Economic Forum, <coughs> Soon after the GNU, I sought, I asked Professor Schwab of the World Economic Forum that I had never, as a young leader, seen our two leaders together in public. And so I wanted to pull off what looked like an impossible feat. I wanted to get the late Robert Gabriel Mugabe and the late Prime Minister Morgan Shangirai together in one room in a public forum. The easier one was um, Koma Morgan. So I rang him. <laughs> and he said, well, let me take counsel. And I said, Mkoma, who do you take counsel from? This is a clear in invitation. <laughs> That's when I got to know that there's this guy called Alex. So 
So I thought I'll check up at a So he agreed and then I went on to the more difficult task. Oh. And Ram Gabe was very difficult. He <laughs> said, Vanondi Tuka. Why do you want them, you know, to do that? And I said, it will do the nation a lot of good in terms of international travel. And so we were able to get them together in Dar es Salaam. And for the first time, they appeared in one room. In fact, there were three of them with uh, Deputy Prime Minister Arthur Mutamba. So Alex, to me, was like those that Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 3, verses 2 to 3. It says, No, you yourselves are our letter of recommendation, our credentials written <coughs> in your hearts, to be known, perceived, recognized, and read by everybody. You show and make obvious that you are a letter from Christ, delivered by us, not written with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human hearts. Dr. Alex's life was truly a letter written in our hearts. Everyone read him and recognized his good work amongst us. His humility touched us. Though he was an academic, he reached out to the commoner. Now that's what I call a pracademic. Hardly ever using high-sounding vocabulary or burying his explanations in legal jargon, his explanations were not in Latin, I consumed, therefore, his tweets and BSR wholesome. I never had to eat the meat and throw away the bones. I chewed literally everything that he wrote. Mm. So how did I get to catch Dr. Alex's attention and actually merit being here this evening? It all began some three years ago when I insulted his soccer team, Arsenal, <laughs> otherwise known as the Gunners. They began to play so badly that I developed a nickname for them on Twitter and called them Wapana Bereke. In other words, the catapult boys on Twitter. This incensed Alex. He immediately shot back with one word in his normally prolific way. He just said, Mukoma, and he put an exclamation mark. <laughs> I knew I was in trouble. <laughs> All you are saying is, how dare you? But that conversation earned me not just a friendship, but a brotherhood via Twitter. And here are my three takeaways for which I hope you will remember, Alex, in all the conversations that I then had with him subsequently. Number one, don't mess with constitutional matters and trample on other people's rights for the expediency of power. Yes. Number two, the rural folks are people too, worthy of title to the land that they occupy. And I know uh, the late Arjim Gabe would have none of it because he argued, and this is these are points that I kept make, making to, to Alex, that it would end up in the hands of foreigners or capitalists. But Alex said they are no less than you township guys. They need title to their land. The third one was that clearly we need to reduce the political risk premium that hangs over Zimbabwe. And the key lies in constitutionalism. These are my three takeaways. I want to commend his colleagues in the Constitutional Law Center and friends and commend them for this befitting tribute of having this memorial lecture. In my humble view, I would advocate that this be an annual ritual in memory of the great Dr. Alex Magai. <coughs> I also want to challenge his mentees, the ones that worked with him, his students, that some form of BSR should continue. 
Yeah. That is my deep, 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 deep desire. Let me close by a comforting scripture. 1 Thessalonians 4 verses 13 through to 18. And I'll read this quickly. It says, Now also we do not have you ignorant, brethren, about those who will fall asleep in death, that you may not grieve for them as the rest do who have no hope beyond the grave. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will also bring with him through Jesus who have fallen asleep in death. <clears throat> For this we declare to you by the Lord's own word that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord shall in no way proceed into his presence or have any advantage at all over those who have previously fallen asleep in him in death. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a loud cry of summons, with the shout of, an, of the archangel, and with the blast of the triumphant, triumph, trumpet of God. And those who have departed in this life, Christ will, will rise first. Then we, the living ones who remain on earth, shall simultaneously be caught up along with the resurrected dead in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so always, through the eternity of eternities, we shall be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort and encourage one another with these words. I thank you. Amen. Thank you so much, Dr. Niger Chanakira. Thank you so much for those words. And also, especially the takeaways, you know, I've always wondered how do we summarize Alex's work, you know, the three takeaways that you have. They're very fundamental. And I'm, I'm also hopeful that the BSR will continue in whatever version it is. Uh, for those who come from Janja, for Alex. Alex will talk about that. His passion for rural life was amazing. As far away as he was from in Kent, etc., he never forgot uh, the issue to do with the rural person in Zimbabwe. Uh, without much further, you may I call upon uh, another of Zimbabwe's prolific sons, Hopo uh, Chimono. Thank you very much. <clears throat> I got a phone call uh, on Sunday from Alex's brother who's sitting here. Uh, I ignored the phone call because I was on another, on another call. And because we were supposed to meet anyway, I said, ah, let's go to the phone now. about it from time to time, uh, be, but because of the towering figure that he was, people didn't pay attention because nobody wanted to imagine that one day uh, we would receive such bad news. So I, I, I like many Zimbabweans, um, met Alex in adult life. Um, in 2007, I made a documentary film called Pain in My Heart. Then it was, a, it was broadcast on Sky News and CNN, and Alex watched the film. 
Uh, I had read a lot of his work when he was uh, contributing to New Zimbabwe. That time, social media was not as vibrant as it is today. So there were little spaces where uh, people like Alex would be found, and New Zimbabwe was one of them. And uh, so after watching this film, um, he, he, he wrote an article uh, about the film. And typical of Alex, it was much more than the film. Uh, although the film triggered him to write the article. So, I'll read a passage from the article. It says, somewhere in the village, bushes of Tacoma, there is a young girl called Tarisai. Every morning, Tarisai wakes up early to fetch water from the sandy bed of mighty Save River. The great river is dry in most parts, so in its vast belly of sand, she digs and digs until the precious liquid oozes into the hole. Amai is unwell. She has been unwell for some time, and she cannot carry her fragile body anymore let alone a load of water on her head. Tarisai is eight. Father was called to another world a year ago. The weight of the homestead is upon Tarisai's young shoulders. Thank you. So, he, he sent an email to me, and that's how our friendship started. Then in the GNU happened, uh, but just before the GNU happened, I had uh, started work on another film called The Violent Response. And Alex would send emails to me uh, if I post something on, on Facebook. Um, and I would say to him, why do you need to worry to get permission from me, for me to use these things? You can use them. And then he would say, I want, you know, in our field of work, things can get complicated. And I would say to him, go ahead and, and, and use the stuff. Um, he came to Zimbabwe to join the Prime Minister's office, and uh, it was when he joined that office that I started to learn a lot more about how government worked. Um, one of the primary things that he told me was that, you know, corruption is so rife in this country beyond what he had imagined. He told me a story. He was supposed to have gone somewhere. Um, and he couldn't go. And um, when he came back to the office, there was a paper waiting for him to sign uh, an allowance of 5,000 US dollars for the trip that he should have gone but didn't go. And he said, No, uh, these are allowances for hotels and things like that. I did not go. So I don't, I don't need this. And uh, senior government people said to him, "Ah, dog, ma kuti zinga na zonje." He was saying, "I, can I say that he did not go to Papua New Guinea?" I'm sure I shared this story with many of you. And and you talk to me about the issue of incompetence. Uh, how bad incompetence was in government. It was so bad that he didn't even imagine uh, that things would be so bad. That's why he said to me, you know, oh, the problem uh, goes beyond what we thought it was. This country is in a total mess. The system needs to be changed. It is not just about an individual. The system is corrupt. Mm -hmm. And we'll talk about the constitution-making process and 
As journalists, I can't think of anyone else in this country who helped our work become so easy other than Alex Magaris. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. You would go to Morgan Changrai's office and interview Morgan Changrai. And then Magaisa would say, ah, one, two more words, one, one. And he would give you a much broader picture of what's going on in government. Um, Dr. Magaisa saved us and many other people from being poisoned so many times. He had established a relationship because of the person that he was with the system, within the system. I'm sure many of you saw Alex talking about enablers. Mm. And then he cautioned us to say, <clears throat> not everyone is an enabler in the system. There are some good people. Mm. And he would, uh, he would call us, oh, be careful of this, be careful of that. Um, I mean, journalists from my generation and those who were there during the GNU, our work was made far much easier. All international journalists, the first thing they would do when they land here is, where is Alex? Because with Alex, you would get a picture of what's happening and you would also then get to interview the, 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 the Prime Minister. Uh, he taught me that, you know, sometimes you disagree with certain things. Uh, but don't throw everything away. Alex was opposed to the 2018 election. His bosses were, wanted the election, but he was opposed to it. Um, and I kept saying to him and to advocate Chamisa that Varumeni, you have got so much knowledge you need to write books so that people can contextualize the Zimbabwean story properly. Dr. Epson was saying to me, ah, para me no rap. And I've been saying to advocate Chamisa, because he's also my friend, he shared certain things with, with me, and I say to him, but President, these are serious issues. You should put pen to paper. And, and, and I hope that story will become complete because he knows a lot of things um, about what happened during that time. Then there was a picture. A picture. And Alex, Alex value, his talk was so high that even his opponents understood it. <clears throat> One day Alex came to Zimbabwe and he went to a restaurant called The Plot with two friends. And uh, at that restaurant, there was Jonathan Moyo, there was Joao, uh, there was uh, Kasukwere, and another gentleman who didn't want to be in the picture. <laughs> a, put, a picture was taken, and Jonathan Moyo posted it on, on Twitter. He understood what he was doing. Because the, the person who carried a lot of value in that picture was Alex. <laughs> <laughs> that is why, that is why they posted the picture. <laughs> so when the picture was posted, Alex called me. Wow. Then she got the breakfast. That's not what I mean. <laughs> and true to what he was saying, they posted the picture. And, but he didn't mind. He then said to me, you know, if, if, if we were doing evil things, they wouldn't be posting a picture with me in it. They understand and they understood the value. And, and then 2017, a couple of days before the coup, Alex wrote a story about Mamfura. Yes. <laughs> a few days before. Mamfura was that guy that you don't expect 
to be behind the wheel of the bus. Oh, finish. <laughs> <laughs> so you are the township. Those of you like who are like me and Alex who grew up in rural areas, the bus would move from township to township, and all the people would get out and buy alcohol, and the bus driver would leave the bus again. One day, my brother. Wait behind the wheel and broke the bus. <laughs> <laughs> then, on the 15th or thereabouts, the coup happened. <laughs> uh, I found myself uh, and Alex, we differed. I thought the coup was going to be a transition. I was in London when the coup happened. And we spoke with Alex. Alex said, Wang, I went to these people, they will not change. <laughs> this is just an opportunity to remove the old men who are standing in their way because they want to continue doing deals, but the old men is with other plans. Uh, the president is going to write his book one day. So I'm not going to say a lot of things. One thing I need to say is that the, the opposition supported the coup. It's on the record. And Alex said to me, our friends are making a mistake. Um, along the way, we had had arguments. And for some time, we were not talking. <laughs> and one day I was sitting in my in my dining room having dinner, the phone rang. It was Alex. Uh, we, we, we need to, to talk so much is happening in our country. Uh, that, that was Alex for me. He is not somebody who felt that because I'm Alex Magaisa, we had a disagreement. I'm not going to come to you. You are the one who's going to come to me. That was not Alex. Alex would talk to young people. I would get screenshots from young people. So excited that imagine, I got to talk to him. He would be, you know. And we used to joke about that. And, and you'd say, now we have to be very careful what we write. Because people, you know, are happy uh, and, 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 and sometimes they share things that are not supposed to be shared. Needless to say, the new dispensation, contrary to the nonsense that I was reading on social media, <laughs> they made an approach to Alex. And I just thought, out of respect, after the period of mourning, if they continue to set the record straight, <coughs> we have got names, we know the people, some of them came through me. And Alex said, no, I'm a Zimbabwean. If you want to do things right, you don't need Magaisa's support. The whole country will support you. <laughs> don't look for individuals. Do the right things and the whole country will support you. Mm -hmm. uh, and I remember in, in, in August, in August, uh, because I, I, I've been a victim as well, because when we said let's give them a chance, they then became angry when we started criticizing them. But in my case, I am not like President Amisa, who's going to write his memoirs after his two terms. I can talk about my story. Uh, in, in August, in August uh, of, of 2018, um, the late, the late Doug Nazi and the living Edwin Manika came to my home, and they wanted to convince me that I should either go into government or go and run the PC. Uh, immediately after they left, I, I called Alex, and I said to him, "This is what these guys are saying." And then Alex said to me, one is called laundering. 
they want to launder their image using you. Yeah. If they are going to do a good job, people like you and me don't need to be opposed in this way. We will want to work with them. Mm-hmm. Even the opposition will want to work with them. Mm-hmm. So let them fix the reforms and every Zimbabwe will go on a plane from the diaspora to come back home mm-hmm. because they want to be part of our offer. And he was right. Um, when, when, when I criticized them, they started attacking me, they started lying that, oh, these people want a job and this and that. There is a lot that happens behind the scenes. And as I, I keep referring to President Sanisa because he knows a lot of the things that were happening behind the scenes during that time and continue to happen uh, behind the scenes. The tragedy for people like me is that we ever relied on Alex. You know, when I entered the room, I was saying to that contact, it's, it's, I'm trying to imagine, you know, whenever I go into trouble, I'll look for my lawyer, Beatrice, etc. or Doug. If I can't find them, I have to look for, for Alex, say, Alex, how, how do I do this? If I done something wrong? <laughs> and, and when I was arrested for the third time in 2021, I was with, uh, Honorable job staff, we were arrested together for the same crime that there's not uh, 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 there's no law that exists for that crime. <laughs> you know, prison officers came to us one day. They were so happy, and they said, "Ah, you know where Nakumbama is, man." And the uh, a job said, "Why? Why are you saying that?" Then they said. He had done a big Sunday, a big Sunday to read. Uh, and these prison, prison officers, they, 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 they read these things. Mm-hmm. And so they came to us and said, I want to do something on my prison. Because they had taken down notes, but it was something. Bifis and Tetra was in Switzerland, struggling with the COVID. And I was worried to catch me and I found it. Job is my witness, I'm not lying. <laughs> and, and I would start, you know, Job would uh, say, I don't know why, because I would start saying, you know, wanting to find out about COVID, and this, because I was worried that, because she's the woman who has been with me since 2004 through all my travels. Uh, I have no access to my guys. Each time I go into prison, my guys have beca- became my de facto uh, spokesperson. In fact, when Doug would come, I would say, go and give this to my guys. Go and give this to my guys. Because he is the person who was able to articulate issues in a way that made it so easy for all of us to understand. Mm-hmm. And, and one of those things that he said to me, which sticks with me, and I will say it, uh, so that when you have your cabinet, when you become president of this country, yeah. You must remember this. He, he said to me, Wang, uh, I took this from, from a WhatsApp message. Wang, uh, political parties have been platforms where individual interests are negotiated, not the national interest. This has to change. You and I have to support Mukoman. Elites of a society from the form that structure that will make it fail or succeed. So he was worried about the ownership syndrome of struggles, both in Zan PF and in the opposition. You'd say to me, it worries me. The, re- the reason I write the way I write, I want to connect with everyone. 
But it worries me when people say, oh, we were there when the struggle started. Uh, you were not there. And it's a Zimbabwean problem. It's not just a Zimbabwean problem. <laughs> Father was not there. How is he a spokesperson? Father was not there. And when President Chamisa came out and said, Cheseta Tanga Pasha, anyone can join the party. There's no senior member, there's no junior member. That made Magaisa happy. And he said, this is going to remove the toxicity in our politics. Um, there's there is, um, one thing about the Big Saturday read. It was able to provide ideas and explain complex issues for ordinary men and women to feel that they are part of the struggle. Instead of being bystanders, listening to a group of guys talking about how great they were. And we, we had so much trust, and I know many of you had so much trust in my guys. Yes, yes, yes. Such that when me and Job were in prison, a Madupu, Professor Madupu came to see us and to discuss our case because our case had become topical. But, but when, uh, when, when, when uh, I'm not a lawyer, he's a lawyer, when, when Professor Madruk was sitting on the other side, I, I was now, because I had now read the, some of the prison officers that had given us this stuff, <laughs> I was now arguing with Madruk now. <laughs> Saying that prof, the law says this in South Africa, there was this and that. And then, you know, my Madhuk is a funny guy. He says that. I'm going to show you my best. <laughs> <laughs> I have also read I have also read that article and I agree with it. <laughs> and so I want to end by saying, by reading another, another from the article that introduced, that made me become friends with Magaisa. One of the paragraphs at the end, he says, and when I watched the whole Portuguese powerful documentary on the scale of AIDS in Zimbabwe, and big though I am, referring to himself as a big man, Magaisa, an African man taught from a tender age to be a man and never cry. I could not hold back my tears. Tears for a broken nation whose politicians continue to dilly dally about power. There is temptation in the topsy turvy world of politics to forget about the silent victims. And through this article, we became very good friends. That is why today is Zimbabwe's towering intellectual giant, Alex Magaisa, has been celebrated in the ghettos, in the townships, rural areas, I saw headmasters uh, writing some stuff and being posted by young boys in rural areas. He touched everyone's heart. And I hope we learn something from it. Thank you. Yeah, I let Hopo continue, but I want to. <laughs> because it was now looking like it's the guest lecture. <laughs> Thank you so much, Opal, for that profound reflection on the life of Alex. From the beginning of your presentation, morning, you could actually seem as if you're not going to be able to proceed. And those profound personal anecdotes and encounters, I think they bring the humanity of Alex, but also the principled Alex. You know, Alex was. Uh, principle not only in public but even in private. And uh, it's something that we beginning to lose as a society. Principle leadership, both outside and inside. And those exchanges. I was also I remember the time the moment when you had your tensions about what we do with the coup, etc. I also had my WhatsApp messages from Alex so he was also reflecting. But it was one of the few was most of us got excited by the transition. Wow. Alex was one of the few that did not really I did not see it as a as any meaningful change. He remained principled saying the moment you go this route, it will be difficult to get out of it. Yeah. I was 
principled on BBC, on all international stages, on even privately when he was engaging with his comrades. There was always one who was on a stage. So I think it's very important uh, for us to understand Alex, the man, and Alex, the advisor, the analyst, the intellectual giant that he was. Uh, I would like to invite now the president of the Law Society, Wellington Magari, just to give us a reflection. Ladies and gentlemen, um, allow me to stand on the protocol that has already been observed. Um, I come here to speak about Alex on behalf of the legal profession. Um, <clears throat> we gather here to honor a rare talent, a man of immense ability and integrity, an astute legal and an astute legal mind, unfortunately lost to Zimbabwe as part of a continuing brain drain. Dr. Alex unfortunately passed away on the 5th of June, plugged away at his prime, two months short of his 48th birthday. For those of us in the legal profession, this was a man with the rare ability to turn technical legal jargon into simple nuances understandable by the village men and women. Maybe this was fittingly so given his humble roots that he never tired to remind his varied audiences made up of the intellectuals uh, in the halls of places like the Kent Law School in the United Kingdom to the women or men in the village, not forgetting his words of followers in the back streets of the Zimbabwe urban centers. From the village boy heading courts in the rural uh, backwater of Chikomba in Mashonal West, Alex Margarisa transformed himself into an intellectual colossus and a constitutional genius, earning himself a place at the top table of the Zimbabwean constitutional <coughs> process between 2009 and 2013. He registered as a legal practitioner in 1998 following his completion of the LLB honours degree from the University of Zimbabwe. He joined one of the leading law firms, Gilbert Lonton and Terence, at the same time as the late Lenmont Jungle. He was purpose-driven and remained true to himself. He never categorized anyone and never kept grudges. I think that is his focus. <coughs> Taken under the wing of an old legal hand, Mr. Mordecai Madame, Alex kept in touch with his roots, shared part of, his, of himself with everyone, and was unfazed by criticism. He was a creative genius and a communicator par excellence. An unassuming gentleman, even when he had everything going for him. When power and money converge, there is normally a transformation of character not with Alex. He remained Alex and Tawanda those very close. He was also very protective of his family and he never paraded them on social media, even with his status. He obviously had his imperfections and was fallible like all of us, but Alex lived well. He tried to live well. Magaisa left a uh, uh, law practice to pursue a master's program in the UK, paving way into his academia, where he caved a niche up to the time of his death. Between 2009 and 2018, Alex served as uh, former Prime Minister's uh, advisor. Alex was a huge resource for the legal profession in Zimbabwe and beyond. His blog, this big Saturday read, untangled complex legal issues in simple language. He used the same platform for social and political commentary, reminding those in authority of their mandate and obligations to the country, at times um, um, using satirical language. Who will forget 
the Mambura story. <laughs> Wama Kaisa was a human rights campaign. He was a human rights campaign of not using his global status to shine light in dim areas um, as Zimbabwe tried into troubled waters at the turn of the century. A legal luminary is falling. He has gone too soon like a candle in the wind. The Law Society of Zimbabwe joins Alex's family, friends, colleagues in mourning a legal luminary whose indelible footprint <coughs> on the profession will be felt by generations to come. May, the month of May was particularly very difficult for us in the legal profession. We lost former High Court Judge Justice Michael Gillespie, former Finance Minister Christopher Kulme, Miss Memory Mafo, Mr. Abdullah Ismail Kassim, and Mr. Kundai Kanyemba. We are all the poor for his person. The best we can do to his memory is to keep his ideas alive. Mm. His ideas of a just and equitable Zimbabwe. A Zimbabwe in which all citizens are equal before the law, as enshrined by the supreme law of the land that is so painstakingly held craft. We have a generational and ongoing mandate to ensure this and more. We have no choice, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much. Okay, that was short. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Makai. Uh, Mr. Makai. Uh, the Alex was also not just about men, he was also friends of the youth. He had so many, Alex could make friendships easily, everywhere he went to make friendships. So I would like to bring in one of the youths, sorry, one of the youths. <laughs> Come on and that's right. Um, thank you very much, Master of Ceremony. In the eyes of some, I might be seen as a former leader of the students' movement, the Zimbabwe National Students' Union, an institution which had a vision to create an inclusive and democratic Zimbabwe with students as integral stakeholders, where student concerns are addressed and academic freedoms are held and promoted. In the year 2020, I was privileged enough from being a student representative council president to be elected into office and serve as president of such an institution. Like any other activist, any other human rights defender, any other pro-democracy campaigners in this nation, in this type of motherland, I was not scared of how they would suppress how they would oppress and how they would repress such individuals who were open-minded. I remember in the year 2020, I was abducted and tortured. I was left dead while he's challenging and demanding the justice for a 22-year-old Tawana Mcheyua who had been abducted and tortured in Blaue. After that, I spent a month in prison without medical attention. They was denied. But I expected this because I knew that the task that I was carrying forth as a student activist, as a human rights defender, was supposed to make sure that the fear for three things disappear like a moth drawn to the flames. The fear of number one, prison. The fear of number two, the hospital, and the fear of number three, the cemetery. Mm -hmm. <laughs> One would think that in a normal country, no youth would have such an image and such a dream where symmetry is not to be feared. But I believe in democracy. So if they challenge anything in the line of democracy, I'm prepared to die. I was standing in for the students' movement. 
Little did I know that there was a giant who stood in the path, who waited for me to bear all these eggs. Even with this little form of knowledge of resistance, he was willing to help me. He was willing to make a call and ask me, are you okay? And this is the legend who brings us together here. This is Alex Tawana Magaisa. While that mentor-to-mentee relationship managed to come between us, I still knew that I was nothing. I was just but a young intellectual who thought that what we are going through in Zimbabwe was unfair. And I knew it from the very beginning that if we do not stand up to defend ourselves, if we do not try at least to die trying to stand, then we will spend the rest of our lives kneeling. Mm. With that vision, with those values, with those principles, with those beliefs, Dr. Alex Tawanda Magaisa told me that he should continue to speak to justice, to speak to freedom, and like any other, to give solidarity to those who were just like myself, victims of state-sponsored abductions, unjust arrests, threats and assaults. He was such a man. While many or oh, some who have spoken before me had, have made mention of the Mambura story. <laughs> it's funny, but um, if I may make this submission unto you, that I hope that one day this Mambura who is driving this bus, <laughs> <laughs> who have a certain force of logic and conscience, to think that he must stop. Because particularly if you are reading the big Saturday read, the Mangura stopped. And the same driver, the normal driver, <laughs> took off. I make such a submission looking at a constituency of the students who get, who graduate and still find nothing. The youth constituency to reach Champato, who will still be there in the streets of Harare, partaking in drugs. Approximately 70.6% of the youth are unemployed, underemployed, misemployed, or employed in trade any less than two US dollars per day per capita. That's right. It's worrisome. Repressive agendas that have been put perpetually. We know particularly the arrest of Joanna Mamombe, Makombore Ruzirishe, Cecilia Chimbili, and other particular young activists who have been made to endure the dungeons of terror. But Dr. Alex Tawanda Magaisa still stood to be a voice of reason and purpose. He still was speaking truth to power. He knew that it's possible to shape the narrative using the mind, but it's also possible for you to craft what's in the mind, put it out there, and make sure that anyone, everyone, everywhere understands it. We resonated with his speech, with his mind in the students' movement, as a youth in particular, as a student in particular. I had a mentor. He would call now and again. He would send me messages on Twitter. Sometimes I knew that these messages were not even worth a reply. I just have to go on WhatsApp on Signal to just call him. And he would tell me that let that spirit which is inside you continue because we need such youth in this year. He was such a person. If maybe he had seen me in the eyes of a student who was just studying an undergraduate degree, he would not have replied. Many of us are well decorated giants in maybe the economic, the legal, the political, social, and ecological 
sectors of our country, but we ignore the youth when they come to us for membership. You are such a person who listened. You are such a person who drew himself down, put himself down to respond. But I still urge you. That doesn't take even three minutes of your time to respond to a youth who is inside your inbox <coughs> trying to get membership. Met with them. Because not only are they in the future like we have been taught by the regime, they are also the present. In the year 1893, particularly, distinctively, on the 14th of March, that is when Karl Marx died. On his deathbed, a helper came and he asked, because he was a renowned philosopher, what would be your last word? But Karl Marx said, get out. Go out. Last words are for fools. We haven't said enough. <laughs> While we gather here, if his body was here, I'm very sure, trust me with this, that is for us to make an attempt to get him back into his senses and ask for his last words. He would have said the same. Why? Because his deeds and actions spoke very well for him. We are in here because we know about the BSR. The children will speak about the family love. The church will talk about the congregant. I myself, just a mentee, I'm talking about a mentor. Those parts of the opposition forces will talk about an advisor who stood firm on the values of transformation, which is now the crocodile liberators and intellectual hyenas who think that they are not going to die. In that regard, I have made mention of Karl Marx, 1883. 92 years later, it's when Dr. Alex Tawanda Magaisa was born, with an interest to deal with issues regarding to constitutionalism. I still wonder, how could you is what pushed you. You can't take part in the constitution making process and then ignore the fundamental pillars and values of the constitution itself when it's not being respected. <coughs> it is why he had such consistency to publish the BSI every Saturday. Even during the night, some have mentioned that after spending a night with him, you still publish. It's such a character. <laughs> I'll go on and go on and talk about my mentor. But allow me to say that we have a task ahead as human beings. If we do not love like he did, if we do not write as he did, but talents are not only limited to writing. You can all influence the narrative in various forms and ways. Some can sing, some can talk and be listened to, some are orators. And we are at this juncture where the citizens should lead the fight for change and you should play a part. <laughs> with all our talents, with all our backgrounds, different. The lesson that we are taught as the youth by Dr. Alex Tawana Magaisa we particularly that we can redirect this vehicle called Zimbabwe into a correct pathway towards change, towards a nation in which the economy makes sense, towards a nation in which there is political stability, a nation in which society looks at the youth not with the eyes of ageism, but with the eyes of potential, with the eyes that know that they are innovators and creators, the eyes that know that these are organic thought intellectuals 
who are energetic enough to shape where our country is going. Not to become a third world in the eyes of others, but to become a first world country. And we shall, as the youth go there. Dr. Magaisa, we shall, as the youth follow through the footsteps that you made. I know if, in conclusion, I was about to say that I'm going to follow through and try to fit in to the shoes that you have, no matter how big they are. You would have told me to go find my own leather and create my own shoes. <laughs> <laughs> because you believed in the greatness of youth, of individuals, that they can even surpass the impact that you made, no matter how great. It is such a mindset that we expect in the adults of today. That the mental people, not even myself, but other youths who are out there in the streets. Thank you for the contribution. And we shall always cherish the love, the state that you walk, the values, the principles that you had to see a Zimbabwe which is free, a Zimbabwe which is just, and a Zimbabwe which sets its eyes on the path of modernization and industrialization. Thank you very much, Doctor. I love you, and we love you. Wang, if you can hear me, they are very eloquent. I can't stop them. <laughs> but I think what is very important uh, from Takuzo, thank you so much, Takuzo, for those words to say, not, it's not only about the future, but the present. But Wang, if you can hear us, I think the present and the future are safe. Yeah. You have done your job here. Uh, you have played your part. Uh, without further ado, may I call upon a, very, a sister that I deeply respect and admire. Uh, very brave, brave sister for that matter. Father Zayma here. It's a very good evening, ladies and gentlemen, all persons who are observed. I stand here this evening with great humility. Uh, the chief spokesperson of the citizens' movement is here, uh, but he's very kindly uh, given me leave to speak um, against protocol. Uh, today is an extremely difficult night for me. Those who know me know that I'm never short of words, know that I always have something to say, and know that I'll always say it confidently. For the first time on Sunday, I was also in church. And you know, when the offering is being given, the choir is singing and you're scrolling through Twitter. And I was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> and I was holding, I was holding my older brother's baby. And I quickly gave the baby to whoever it was who was sitting next to me, I can't even remember. And I went and made a telephone call to the president, and I said, surely not. No, Ms. Mahere, it's, it's true. I sat down, didn't go back into church. I asked the Sunday school kids to go and get my handbag so I could go home. I sat in the car, and then the journalists started calling, as they always do. The first person who called me was Mdudusi. I picked up the phone and I answered, and I couldn't get out the hello. I got multiple calls, Voice America, blessings to a number of people, Studio 7, wanting a comment. And those who know me know that no matter how cornered I am, I always have a comment. I had nothing to say, and I said, sorry colleagues, this is not the time. This is not the time. I fumbled together a statement on instruction. <laughs> it was the most difficult statement I've ever had to write. It was difficult because normally when I've got difficult statements to write, who do I call? Alex. When I've got a tough line to navigate, who do I call? Alex. 
When I face hostility, who do I call? Alex. And when I was preparing my address for this evening, I said to myself, you know, we're going to be in a church, let's, let's try and keep it neutral. Then I said to myself, what would Alex say about neutrals? <laughs> Alex was very clear on which side of the line he stood. Mm -hmm. He did not stand in the middle. Yeah. <laughs> he stood clearly for transformation and for change. He was unapologetic <coughs> to work for Morgan Shangirai in the MDC. He was unapologetic about working with the MDC Alliance as it then was. He was unapologetic about working with and being a strong <coughs> pillar of the Triple C <coughs> and the citizens. And I know I speak on behalf of the President and the entire organization and indeed the wider Zimbabwean population <coughs> that we are forever indebted for even the technical support he rendered to the movement. You give him a draft policy address, he'd fix it up for you. You'd give him a draft statement, he'd fix it up for you. You'd ask him, how do we navigate? Or you'd pick up the phone and say, hey, Alex, can you see that guy's coming after us? He's coming after us. Please, go after that guy. <laughs> Alex was that mid midfielder. Didn't matter. <laughs> Didn't matter, Nigel, you do soccer. It didn't matter who the striker from the other side was. He was prepared to take that person on. And he did so with intellectual acuity. He did so using the law, using his expertise, and just an amazing humility and eloquence that it's going to be very difficult to match. We are very grateful for his public support Often, elites don't publicly support the movement. Mm -hmm. They want somebody to do it, but they don't want it to be themselves or their own child. Alex was happy to put himself out there. <coughs> if Mr. Timber, if Mr. Makone, if the old, older <laughs> members of the MDC were here, they would agree with me and say that he had a depth of understanding of issues, of people, and of the landscape that we're going to miss greatly. Just this week, I've been confronted with situations where I'm like, oh, let me call Alex. <coughs> Can't call Alex. Mm -hmm. Alex was that person where you're working midnight at chambers, you send him a voice note and say, look, this has happened, what do I do? He'd respond with a voice note and say, you know, Fuzzy, why don't we do this? Fadzi, why don't you take this line? Always, always willing to help. Now, I didn't wake up a member of the Triple C. I didn't wake up a member of the MDC. Alex believed in me when most people still treated me with a lot of suspicion. When this flag came about in 2016, Alex was one of those first responders, first believers. And the idea of citizen activism. And even though it wasn't cool, it wasn't popular, he picked up the phone and said, Fuzzy, you're onto something with bond notes. And I remember writing a piece on my old blog about bond notes, and I took on another lawyer who now is a very good friend of mine. And that lawyer said, Oh, how dare you, Fuzzy? You're so young. Alex was like, No, 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 this is discourse. Let's engage. And that's the man that Alex was. He encouraged, he encouraged. Just the other day, my little sister forwarded me a number of inboxes that she got from Alex when I was in prison. Oh no, don't cry, Mubiwa. Your sister wouldn't want you to cry. Your sister would want you to be courageous. How is Fuzzy doing today? Did you find her in high spirits? Alex cared. He cared even beyond what people saw. He didn't do it for show. He didn't do it for, for fame. When he wrote the big Saturday read, it was with the genuine intention to inform citizens. Because there are those who know that when the citizens are not informed, they're not power, they don't have power. But when citizens are informed, 
When citizens do know their constitutional rights, they sit with their back straight and they're able to talk back and stand up for themselves. That is the constitutionalism he championed time and again. In 2018, when I stood as an independent, when I made the announcement, it still wasn't that popular. But Alex was the first on the phone to say, you know what, well done for standing up. Well done for putting your hand up. Alex understood that the penny drops for people at different times. Mm. It's not the fact that you were there in 2000 that counts alone. Even if you've had your awakening in 2022, he was willing to encourage you and give you the tools to take on the regime. Mm. He embraced young people. Young people, he was interested in a new age of activism and ensuring that there was another generation available to pick up the mantle. Solidarity is something he championed. Whether we're talking of the NDC trio, whether we're talking of Marco, whether we're talking of Taku, whether we're talking of Tawanda and Chehiwa, it didn't matter. If Alex was around today, he'd be saying, <coughs> where is more blessing? That's right. That is Alex for you. Now, even as I sat with colleagues thinking about the best way to, to commemorate of these five days, the life of Alex, I was reminded that the, the task ahead of us is an enormous one. The work that Alex started is not yet finished. Mm, mm. We are still the Zimbabwe, notwithstanding the great constitution of 2013, that he helped author, that the police will say, no, you can't have a big Saturday march. That's rather odd. What does Section 57 say? They don't care. They say to you, no, you can't peacefully light a candle for Alex Magaisa in the park because you know what? Repression. What this tells us is that we need to pick up very strongly the fight that Alex was a brave part of. There is still a lot of work to be done to ensure that we get to a new great Zimbabwe. And the question we all need to ask ourselves is what can I do? How can I be an active citizen? How can I fight for freedom? How can I raise up my voice and join the others? How can I ensure that I register to vote? And I think the biggest gift we could give to Alex is to deliver one day in Zimbabwe where freedom, where politics, where believing different are not dirty words, where you don't have to hide the fact that you're wearing yellow because it's dangerous. You don't have to hide the fact that you believe that the government is getting it wrong. It's Zimbabwe where we don't have to hide the fact that we're political and be ashamed of it. Nothing I'm saying there is new. It's all contained in the constitution that Wama Gaisa helped author. Amen. My brother, my friend, my helpmate, uh, you, you didn't have to help me, but you did. And I'm so grateful. And to the Magaisa family, I extend on behalf of millions of citizens whom he touched whether it's Mazizi, whether it's the Yellow Movement, whether it's, you know, Zimbabwe is far and wide in rural Zimbabwe, in urban areas, in the ghetto, in the universities, even people as far as the United Kingdom. I had a friend the other day who said to me, Fazai, how did you know Alex? He taught me company Lord Kent. This is someone I'd worked with in The Hague. I don't think we yet realize the enormity of the void that Alex left. He touched Zimbabweans here and abroad, but he also touched people from other nations as well. That's right. Zorora um, Murugare, we can't question God, but I, I really pray that he, he rests in peace. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alfred. Uh, 
deep words. Uh, we are all hurting, we're still mourning the loss of a very dear brother. Uh, I don't know when we say what is Zimbabwe's biggest or who is Zimbabwe's biggest export. I've always said there are certain places where I've opened doors by name dropping. You know, I would say, I'm from Zimbabwe, you know Alex Wagaisa? <laughs> then some places I'll say, you know Oliver Mtukuzi? I'm from Zimbabwe. <laughs> then there are certain places, I would say, you know, Beatrice Mteso, 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 uh, and thanks to the colleagues at the Constitutional Law Center putting this together and bringing all of us together and to honor Alex in such a way because like they themed uh, today, they themed today as Alex the academic, yes. Alex the knowledge generator. Yeah. Uh, so we are theming, we are trying to understand because it's so multifaceted. We can't do justice to Alex in one day or in one city. So as we reflect on Alex's contribution to academia, especially the legal field, etc., I don't think there's anyone better able to do this than our very own. And we're very honored for this, our very own. I've known uh, our next speaker in both their personal capacity and also in their public capacity. So it's something that gives us, it warms our hearts, because you would notice, and for those who are following Alex like we did, whenever he came to Zimbabwe, one of the images you would show would be when he's with three theaters mm. or visiting theaters, doing this, etc. So I think it was that recognition. You know, uh, I think elephants recognize each other, lions recognize each other, <laughs> one giant. <laughs> so I think for me, it's a, it's a very, it's not an easy task, like I said, to, to just to be here and to begin to say we are starting this process. Because, like I believe, and Koma Nigel has already met the call that we need this done on an annual basis, the Alex Magaisa Memorial Lecture. For those who are from the Faculty of Law, you know, but the Kempton Makamure Memorial Lecture. So we hope that we can build upon those and begin to really sort of begin also to celebrate our own people, celebrate our heroes in this way. So as we celebrate Alex the academic, it gives me great pleasure to welcome to the podium none other than Sis Beatrice Mitteko.
you are all wrong that you mentor young people. And I'm speaking from experience because although I could have been his mother, he actually mentored me in more ways than me. And it's extremely difficult for me to speak about him in the past tense because I can't imagine that he's in the past. And I strongly believe that what he has done will live, live there forever for us to build on. So as we commemorate his life today, my biggest regret is that we celebrate each other when we are no longer with each other. To the CLC guys,